I'm Charlie Sykes. It's the first weekend of June and we're running a temperature deficit for the year. Sunday Insight checks which way the political winds are blowing right now. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday Insight. In the week that was, in Madison, sharp division among Republicans as conservatives revolt against a state budget with too much spending and too small tax cuts. Questions for Attorney General Eric Holder. Did he lie to Congress about his role in investigating journalists? The Brewers in a dismal May, making it the worst month in franchise history. Really. Photo ID uh, for voting wins a judicial battle. The bill's constitutionality is upheld by the State Court of Appeals. Other challenges are still pending, and the cases are still headed to the state Supreme Court. A purge on the Milwaukee County Board as Chairwoman Marina Dmitrievich strips some of her critics of key committee assignments. And Milwaukee gets a new Parks Director to replace Sue Black, who was fired by County Executive Chris Abley last year. But we start with a proposal for a big tax cut and a conservative revolt in Madison. Three quarters of a billion dollars. State Representative Dale Coinga unveiled a proposal to reform and cut Wisconsin state income tax last week, adding about $450 million to cuts already proposed by Governor Scott Walker. Coinga's plan would cut the number of tax brackets from five to three and simplify the tax code by eliminating 20 special interest loopholes. Bi business groups quickly rallied around the plan, but it faces an uncertain future in Madison where politicians generally prefer to spend money rather than cut taxes. That led to a conservative revolt as 11 Republicans in the assembly signed a letter saying they could not vote for the current state budget making its way through the Joint Finance Committee. The 11 said, we cannot both represent our constituents and our conservative principles by supporting the budget in its current form. And they listed a series of objections ranging from taxes to bonding to DNA collection to spending. Uh, joining me on our panel this morning, political strategist Linda Bruin, former state representative Michelle Litchens, the Milwaukee Community Journal's Michael Holt, and political consultant Mary Jo Boss. Okay, Mary Jo, let me ask you this question. Why is it so hard to get a big tax cut through a uh, state government where you have a Republican governor, a Republican Senate, and a Republican Assembly? Well, there's always somebody who wants to spend it. Yeah. Um, right now, this should be a done deal. This is, this is why Republicans got the majority. This is what their constituency wants. Yeah. For them to risk that majority that they worked so hard to get is insane. This is what the people want. This is why they are there. Oh, okay, Mary, uh, Linda Brooke. Well, I think it's fascinating yeah. as a Democrat watching this. Um, first of all, I, I happen to think that the proposed tax cut is just so extreme that that's the main answer why the Republicans themselves are having trouble with it. But I'm so, so when, you're, what when your buddy Jim Doyle uh, jacked up taxes well, by hundreds of millions the, of dollars, that wasn't extreme. Well, yeah, that's extreme on the yeah. other end. But uh, you know, and the irony here is, what is the governor's reaction to this, and what is he going to do? They're basically these, these Republicans basically one-upped this very popular Republican governor, and obviously, I don't think he's real happy with it at this well, point. Well, I'm not sure that. That's the case. I mean, part of what happened since the governor proposed his tax cut was that the state had found itself with more money, $500 million more in, uh, in, in, in revenues, and of course the savings from the University of Wisconsin. So the, the politicians now have $750 million or so on the table. So the question is, are conservatives going to cut taxes? Are they going to simplify taxes, or are they going to go small? Michelle I hope Lichens. they're going to cut taxes. I yeah. hope they're going to by cut taxes by more than what the governor proposed, yeah. um, substantially more, and I hope they're going to simplify the tax code. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, when we started talking about this budget at the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. you did not have a chance for school choice to pass in the Senate. Right. So you're going to have to give some of that money to additional school funding if you want to make sure you see school choice in the budget. Okay, but you still have $750 million. Now, what I'm being told is that, that even though Republicans are saying publicly that they're all supporting Dale Coinga. The fact is the guy's very, very isolated. He's out there on an ice floe by himself. And that, that despite the public statements of support behind closed doors, they're trying to push him down to just $150 million. Now, what does that say about conservatives in Wisconsin? If you have $750 million on the table and you can only cut taxes by 150? I would hope that they're going to be able to cut taxes yeah. by not only what the governor said, but substantially more than 150. Yeah. But again, you need to make sure that the Senate's willing to vote for yeah. that and the governor's going to sign it. Okay. Yeah, I find this to be quite humorous, to be quite honest. But beyond that, you know, how did the state get so much in debt to begin with? You know, we've been talking about three and four billion dollar deficits for the last 10 years and smoke and mirrors and they all go away. Wouldn't it be better to put some of this money aside, reinvest it in education, put money into a savings account so we don't have to worry about another deficit 
next year. Well, you don't okay. know what's going to happen around the corner. Well, that, that, that's always true. But I mean, look, here's the bottom line here. We haven't mentioned his name. I mean, you know, State Senator Mike Ellis, who is uh, apparently has now become the king of, uh, of the Capitol because all of these arguments are you can't get the, the budget through the Senate unless Mike Ellis votes for it. He's so the new as, Gary George. So as a, well, that's a good, that's a good analogy. So, so as a result, almost everything seems to be what does Mike Ellis want? What does Mike Ellis not want? And I think that explains why those 11 conservatives in the assembly signed that bill, which is that, okay, this is not all about Mike Ellis. We didn't come here to do what Mike Ellis wanted. And I think what is going to be interesting is this, is, is, is this, there's a real division on the Republican Party, isn't there right now? There is, but I wouldn't characterize Del Quang as out on his own. No. I think the rank and file very much support him. And they look at it as, if you go to the grocery store and you're overcharged, they give you the money back. Yeah. They don't use it to buy lights at the, at the grocery store. They give it back to the people who paid it. And that's what they want to have happen. Okay, what is going to happen? How much are they going to get on the tax cut? I think they're going to get over $300 million. I think they're going to get most, most of what okay, they what want. Do you, what do you I think they are too about that. How much do you think they're going to get? Oh, I think they're going to get way more than Walker, but I, but I don't think anywhere near Queen Yanga's figure. I, 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 I think that the assembly ought to go big. The assembly ought to go at least $400 million and then and then challenge, and then then the, challenge Senate, yeah. the Senate to vote against a tax cut. Yeah. So what has your glass half full and what has your glass half empty? Let's go around the table. Lynn, you're first. Well, my glass is half full because the Joint Finance Committee wisely cut a well-intentioned but flawed plan of the governors to extend the school, uh, private school voucher systems to special needs kids. That plan, it, the particular plan was flawed, so my, but my glass is half empty because they didn't put in place any planning to eventually extend the, the voucher program to special needs kids. Michelle. That was my bill. I love that. That was good. Um, my glass is half full because people are coming around to supporting the raw milk idea. But my glass is half empty because not only did the raw milk jury, but others just continue to um, nullify the law. And you can't do that in a country that it, that is supposed to be a law-abiding country. Michael. It is half full because the police department, the fire and police commission is now instituting some new policies to stop these scandals about strip and search. It's half empty because unless you change the culture of the Milwaukee Police Department, it's still going to happen. Mayor Joe. Republicans hold the majority in both houses of the legislature. My glass is half full because of Republicans like Representative Del Coyne. My glass is half empty because of Republicans like Senator Mike Ellis. Uh, well, my glass is half full because when uh, Attorney General Eric Holder asked the media to meet him for a secret uh, off-the-record meeting, a number of major news outlets like the New York Times said, no, we're not participating in those closed-door sessions, which is an indication that the media's love affair might be waning, but it's half empty because other news uh, outlets like the Washington Post showed up, so maybe not. Still ahead on Sunday Insight, Republicans divided also over how to expand school choice, and as we go to break, President Obama missing every one of his five tosses at an arcade game on the Jersey Shore. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie nails it on his first try. And some transparency from the president about a lipstick smear on his collar. It came from a greeting in a White House reception. Where's Jessica Sanchez? <laughs> Jessica, no, it wasn't Jessica, it was her aunt. Where is she? <laughs> Auntie, right there. Look at this. Look at this. I just want everybody to witness. So, I do not want to be in trouble with Michelle. That's why I'm calling you out, right in front of everybody. What's ahead for school choice? Republicans were divided on taxes, were also divided on choice last week. A tentative deal would have expanded the choice plan statewide, but, and this is a big but, capped the program at just 500 students the first year and 1,000 the second. Participation would have been limited to no more than 1% of students in any district. The deal dropped Governor Walker's proposal to expand the program to cities like Green Bay, cut the amount he proposed to spend on choice schools, dropped special needs scholarships, eliminated the expansion of charter schools, so... This is a pretty crappy deal, wasn't it? Uh, well, it's yeah. not done. I yeah. think we have to know that it is not done. A yeah. deal officially has not been cut. It hasn't yeah. been voted on and set in stone. We need to expand school choice in the state of mm -hmm. Wisconsin. There's no doubt about that. But if we look back, like I said in January, we thought school choice wasn't going to go anywhere mm -hmm. because the Senate wasn't going to move it forward. So politically speaking, I think any time you can move it forward in the state of Wisconsin, it's a win. Okay, Michael Holt. Yeah, I was extremely disappointed. Even the General Sentinel came out about the special ed dollars. And school choice, let's, let's be honest, you're giving $6,000 right. to these schools who are barely making it, and then you, you cry about the results. 
that needed to be increased significantly. And then, and, and then lastly, what we needed to do is have an expansion of charter schools throughout the state. That's even President Obama's plan. So why would you, you know, I, I don't understand what the Republicans are doing. They used to be on our side, then they went on our side, now they... Okay, I, 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 I have doing. to admit, this actually shocked me because, okay, going back to Mike Ellis, who, you know, is the king of the Capitol, and he didn't want to expand uh, choice to Green Bay, okay? That was his bottom line. If you negotiate with him, couldn't you at least get more funds for these choice schools that we have right now? So not only did we not get uh, an expansion statewide, really, uh, of, of school choice to these other cities, but you know, you're right, the choice schools that are here that are operating are grossly underfunded. So the fact that they agreed in this compromise to slash the increase from Governor Walker's budget made it almost a lose, lose, lose And how did, he, how did he become this kingpin? I mean, is he really reveling in this power? So he's just gonna okay. disrupt everything? Could you explain this was Mary Jo Boss? Well, amazingly <laughs> enough, Republicans are negotiating with themselves yeah. and losing. Yeah. Um, yes, you got, you got choice statewide, but at what cost? This, the, the current choice schools were in line to get a bump yeah. in the funding that they desperately needed. Desperately needed. That funding, some of, part of that funding was given up for a statewide program right. that doesn't have enough people in it to, to be put the pressure on public schools to improve, but isn't going to be a big boon to the private schools because out of 500, 400-some school districts, you have about 500 people slots to participate. Well, Linda Bruin. I totally agree with Mary Jo. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. They, the, the bottom line is, I, I guess the only thing I'd add to it is that there is something to be said about a plan that expands it statewide. The minute you get that foot in the door, that yeah. you know th those numbers could go from 500 to 5,000 yeah. in a matter of a couple of years. So I do, you know, I don't think it's a total lose lose right. if you're a pro school private school voucher system person. I do think though, you know, as someone who supports the public schools as well, I do think you're gonna end up with a compromise that backfills some money to them. Okay, you may not want to hear it, but we're gonna tell you anyway. Let's dish out some unsolicited advice. Linda Bruin, you get to go first. Well, the TSA just finished removing all of those naked body scanners in our airports, and so most of us think we're not gonna see them again, but not so. They just signed a $245 million contract to get new machines with the same health risks. So my right. advice to them is, Use the 700 traditional scanners that are already in our airports and save the 245 million. Michelle Litchens. Uh, the uh, Joint Finance Committee did a great thing by denying United Council a mandatory fee that each student was paying every year to lobby for liberal interests. So my uh, advice to you is that recipes.com has some great bake sale ideas. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> George Mitchell came out of retirement to call Polly Williams a racist. George, go back into retirement. We don't want to hear from you. Mary Jo Boss. Milwaukee County Board Chair Marina Dmitrievich punished her critics this week by withholding plum committee assignments. My unsolicited advice, if you're going to shoot the king, you better not miss. Well, my unsolicited advice is for Republicans in Madison. Remember who sent you there. Remember what you said you were going to do there. Remember who you work for. And hint, it's not Mike Ellis. Coming up on Sunday Insight, everybody agrees the video is outrageous. So why do all the prosecutors agree there was nothing criminal in the death of Derek Williams in the back of a Milwaukee police squad car? There will be no federal charges in the death of Derek Williams in police custody. The U.S. attorney announced last week that after its own investigation, it would not be issuing charges against any of the Milwaukee police officers involved in the case. And that follows a similar decision by a special prosecutor, which follows a similar decision not to bring charges by the Milwaukee County DA's office. They all agreed that even though this video is outrageous and disturbing, the officer's conduct was not criminal. But the Journal Sentinel editorial board raised this question. Would the result have been any different had Williams not been a poor, young African-American, saying that that is a, quote, question that is resonating in the Milwaukee community? What do you think, Michael Holt? It would have been different if he was a white kid, if he was your son, your son, or, or, or one of Lynn's children. It would have been different. That all of these different agencies have gone through this, and I can understand their rationale, and they can say that they tried to revive him. But it was, this whole thing was based on a prejudice. They a prejudice all that them? all of okay. these, okay. all of these all criminals, of quote unquote, criminals, are trying to fake it. The police so department, gonna, the DA's office, John Frankie, you know, the, the, Barack the, Obama's Department the, of Justice. The, the irony is that we went through all this hoopla, 
I said on this show the week after this happened that everybody would march, get upset, everybody would make all these inflammatory statements, but nothing would happen. This is Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Mary Jo Boss. I think it's ugly and horrific, yeah. but that doesn't mean it was criminal. Right. And I would, I would dispute what you say. Things have changed. There Where? have Things have happened. The police department has changed their policies. They have made sure they if somebody says the it, they, they will were call to an respond. EMT. They, were they supposed are going to, to respond. They were supposed to respond, but they had this preconceived notion, this prejudice that he was faking. Anybody who was captured they were, they is were faking. Wrong. Okay, but they, they, okay, they were wrong. That's an so error. Render that's assistance. Have, but that is an error. She would have. She would have rendered assistance. I would have yeah. rendered assistance. Michael, you would have okay. rendered assistance. I, I agree that that a lay person would have rendered assistance. Absolutely. But the bottom and these line. Are trained and, and I'm not excusing their behavior. But the but what I read from the from the federal perspective is that they had to feel that they could prove that there was an intent to deprive and him I, of I his civil it. rights. That's different than stupidity or. Um, a generic, you know, misbelief about how criminals or suspected yeah. criminals act. That's different. And, and so by the, you know, at the federal level, I thought that was one of the high, hardest cases to prove. Okay. Yeah. You know, if I was his mom or a family yeah, member yeah. or someone in the community, I'd be angry too, mm -hmm. because really what happened, uh, it's a tragedy. But at the same time, we have seen that the department's made some changes because of it. Yeah. So hopefully it's something like this never happens what again. What changes have they made? But let, let me go back that. to the point. Of, what changes have they made? Well, the, the, the procedural Every changes that they were supposed to. Every person has to go to a hospital I mean, now. Yeah, Everyone's those, going those, those, now. Which is, is going to be complication. I guess we'll go back to this whole question though. That, I mean, how many times does this have to be reviewed by all sorts of different? I mean, if you, if the Journal Sentinel editorial suggestion that this was racially biased, would you agree with? I think is kind of outrageous when you think we just went through the federal Justice Department, we had this is Eric Holder's department, Barack Obama's Justice Department. At what point do you say, and okay, still an investigation well, ongoing? There, there, and, to see if there's and a ultimately, pattern. ultimately, this is going to go to a civil trial, and I think probably this will be handled more as a negligence matter than as a criminal matter. Somebody will be held accountable at that point, and maybe that's the way it should go. Okay, is what they said this week the same thing as what you heard? Let's go around the table. Into room. Well, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman listed a whole bunch of noble reasons as to why she's not running for re-election. But because she was she bought television re-election campaign ads just two weeks earlier, what I heard was that it is that this probably has nothing to do with our forefathers, term limits, or apple pie. Uh, Michelle Lichten. Well, we all heard Lois Lerner invoke the Fifth Amendment just last week, right? And that was acceptable then. But I think just a few days ago, an Illinois teacher, John Dryden, told his students that they could invoke the Fifth Amendment when filling out a survey. But that was that's totally unacceptable. Michael Holt. Back to good old George Mitchell. <laughs> he said that Polly Williams is a racist. What I heard was if you have pride in being black, if you're a proud African-American, then you're a racist. It doesn't add up. Mary Jo Boss. Democrat spokesman Brad Woodhouse believes that those in the media who refuse to, believe, to meet with Attorney General Eric Holder kind of forfeit their right to gripe. Yeah. What I heard was the Obama administration doesn't believe you have a right to gripe about their mistakes. Well, what uh, they said, all the Republican legislative leaders said, we're all behind Dale Coinga's tax reform plan. Absolutely, we have his back. What I heard was he's on his own. Next on Sunday Inside, our panel picks the winners and losers of the week. But first, here's your morning news update. It's time for our panel to pick winners and losers of the week. And Linda Bruin, you're first. Well, my winner is First Sergeant Gregory Fulton, who was honored Friday for saving soldiers' lives during enemy fire in Afghanistan. He's the first member of the Wisconsin National Guard to be awarded the Silver Star. My loser is Milwaukee County Supervisor Mark Burkowski. Mark has been a leader in law enforcement issues for more than 20 years. But unfortunately, he was just removed as chairman of the county board's Judiciary and Public Safety Committee for purely political reasons. Michelle Litchens. Voter integrity finally won in Wisconsin. The court said we can require a photo ID in order to vote. Our legislators have some cleanup work to do, but there is a good chance by 2014 you will have to prove you are you if you want to vote. Senators Luther Olson and Rob Coles have a chance to get out of the, lo the loser column. You were helped by countless volunteers who worked their tails off for you during the recall elections. You promised your voters you'd vote like a conservative. Now it's time to hold up your end of the bargain and tell Senator Ellis to do the same. Michael Holt. I agree with Michelle, but for the other reason. It's going to be George you know, Mitchell, right? George, George, <laughs> no, no, it's, not not George. it's about okay. voter ID, which moved one step closer to becoming reality. 
my winners, everyone who is graduating this week and next week, particularly my grandson, Amir, who graduated from a junior college at the age of 17, will be going to Clark Atlanta. I can guarantee you that his father is uh, looking down on him with gratefulness and pride. Mary Jo. My winner is democracy. This week, a jury in Sauk County refused to convict an Amish farmer accused of selling raw milk. As it says on the ceiling of the governor's office, the will of the people is the law of the land. My losers are opponents of election reform who saw a state appeals court affirm the constitutionality of Wisconsin's photo ID law. Well, winner, unfortunately, by caving into his demands, Republican leaders make Mike Ellis the king of the Capitol, so I guess that makes him a winner. Loser, kids. Governor Walker's choice proposals would have given thousands of children a chance to get a better education. In Madison, the politicians blocked that chance. Thanks for joining us. Join me for my radio show Monday morning on News Radio 620 WTMJ from 8.30 until noon. Have a great week.